Good evening. Welcome to our live stream service tonight from South Park Christian Center in National City. We're so glad you've joined us and we're just believing the Lord to minister to everyone that's tuned in and we feel his presence here in the room. We have already prayed and given this evening to the Lord and we just want him to meet you right where you are. Whatever your need is tonight, just know that he is able. And as we pray together, let's give those needs to him now. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of coming into your presence daily, Lord. We thank you for tonight. We so look forward to being in this Bible study with each one on Wednesday nights. And I pray, Father, that you will speak to each of us from your precious word, that you, Lord, will meet the need of everyone listening tonight. Those that have burdens, they will lay them at your feet and receive your help for salvation and deliverance and healing and provision and whatever is needed, Lord. Bless our worship team tonight as Ruth and Gary and Cosette and David lead us in worship. I just pray that you will anoint them as well. Receive it all, Lord, for your honor and glory, and we commit this evening to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Pain no longer has a place to hide. I am now captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain there's power that can empty out a grave there's resurrection power that can save there's power in your name power in your name there's power that can break off every chain there's power that can empty out a grave there's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Only there is no one like you. There is no one beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Yes, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Oh 
despise for saving me. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and cheer me. Thou will find a soul.
all the things the Lord does for us, that's the most wonderful, isn't it? That he's the savior of our soul. It's such an amazing relationship to have. Well, get your Bibles, and tonight we'll go back to the book of Nehemiah, chapters 5 and 6. Up to this point, Nehemiah's challenges as the spiritual leader focused on those outside of Judah. But before the walls were finally rebuilt, he encountered difficult, intense problems within the broken walls. Not from Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, but from his own people. Nehemiah 5.1 says, And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brothers. There were four such difficulties that they were facing. Number one, there was a food shortage for the worker and their families. The work on the wall hindered them taking care of their crops, and the crop failure had created a famine. Number two, some had grain, but to get it, they had to mortgage their fields, their vineyards, and their homes. Others, not wanting to mortgage their property, had to borrow money from their Jewish brothers to pay property taxes to the king. And number four, to compound the problem, they were charged exorbitant interest rates by their own Jewish brothers. Finally, to pay their creditors, they had had to sell their children into slavery. And this left them feeling very hopeless. All these difficulties created an internal crisis in Judah. And it was double trouble for Nehemiah. Their enemies were a constant threat to their security and their well-being. And now the Jews were taking advantage of other Jews. Morale, which was already low, because of external pressures, exhaustion, and fear, took another plunge. Nehemiah's initial response was deep anger, verse 6. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and their words. Verse 7. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and elders, saying, Each of you is exacting usury from your brother. Nehemiah confronted this problem head on and called for a large assembly gathering. First, he rebuked those who were violating God's command not to charge their own people interest. Money could be loaned, but not to gain interest from another's distress. Then he pointed out that he and others had bought back or redeemed Jews which had been sold into slavery. Also, he pointed out that God's reputation was at stake their behavior was bringing reproach on the one who had delivered them from Egyptian bondage and Babylonian captivity. Verse 9, he said, What you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God? Nehemiah's next action was intensely personal. Verse 10, he said, I also and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Please, let us stop this usury. Restore to them now, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their homes, and the interest that you have charged. This action was to be immediate. He said, even this day it must begin. Note the people's response in verse 12. So they said, we will restore it, and we will require nothing of them. We will do just as you say. Then Nehemiah required an oath from them in the presence of the priests. Verse 13. Then I shook out the folds of my garments and said, So may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not pay this promise. Even this may be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Then the people did according to his, their promise. Note Nehemiah's continued personal generosity. At some point, he was appointed governor over Judah and remained there for 12 years. This was the highest office, and they were given a food provision as well. But Nehemiah nor his team used the king's provision for themselves. 
though former governors had laid burdens on the people, taking food and money from them, Nehemiah said, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Verse 16, indeed, I also continued the work on the wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for work. And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers besides those who came to us from the nations around us. Note the food preparation for one day. One ox, six choice sheep and fowl. Yet in spite of all of this, he did not demand the governor's provision for himself because the bondage was heavy on the people. Nehemiah bore the cost of it all rather than place burdens upon the people. He could have exploited the poor, but he did not abuse his position as governor in any way. In fact, he continued working with them on the wall during this time. His motives were pure. He never lost sight of God's calling on his life. He was in Jerusalem to help the people, not exploit them. He was there to exemplify God's law, not violate it. And he was there to rebuild the wall, not his own empire. As a man of prayer, Nehemiah was in constant touch with God. In verse 19, he prayed, Remember me, O Lord, for good, for all that I have done for your people. This is the same prayer he prays at the end of the book, as we will see as well. In chapter 6, we see that his opposition is back. This opposition was against Nehemiah personally. It came in the form of three attacks, each designed to take his life or destroy his effectiveness as a leader. Nehemiah 6.1, Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that we had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left, although the gates were not in yet, they said, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm, said Nehemiah. This plan was subtle, and it looked like a simple meeting plan. Ono was near the border of Samaria, and that was where Sanballat's house was. <clears throat> what looked like a peace conference, though, was a hidden plot to harm Nehemiah. Nehemiah suspected foul play. Why would they want to take him a day's journey away from Jerusalem where he could no longer supervise the work that was being done? By outnumbering him, they might do him harm, he thought. Nehemiah accused them of nothing but sent messengers to them, and I love this verse. I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. When we're doing God's work, it is a great work. We cannot afford to be distracted by anything that comes against us. Why should the work cease, he said, while I leave and go down to you? Verse 4, they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner each time. He was giving them opportunity to prove their motives were sincere rather than offering to meet them in Jerusalem. Finally, their fifth response displayed their hand. It read in verse 6, it is reported among the nations that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall and you will be their king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem saying, this is the king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come and let us consult together. When they saw that they could not get Nehemiah to leave Jerusalem, they decided to pressure him into coming. First, it appeared that they were trying to protect him and make him respond out of fear. But they did not realize that this was God's man on a heavenly assignment and nothing could deter him from doing what God had given him to do. I love that. Oh, that God's people would always have that attitude toward what he has called them to do. Nehemiah's response in verse 8 tells it all. Then I said to them, no such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. His response demonstrated his trust in the Lord, and he outwardly denied all of their accusations.
They all were trying to make us afraid, saying, their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not get done, and it will bring the king's wrath on us. Then as Nehemiah regularly did, he prayed again, saying, now therefore, O God, strengthen our hands. Their next attempt was to destroy his credibility by luring him into the temple. They hired Shemaiah to propose a solution to Nehemiah, saying in verse 10, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are going to kill you. In fact, tonight they will come to kill you. Nehemiah discerned two flaws in Shemaiah's so-called prophecy. Number one, why would God ask him to run and leave the work when it was so nearly finished? Number two, no two prophet would ask someone to violate God's law. Only priests were allowed in the sanctuary, and if Nehemiah had entered it, he would have desecrated it and brought God's judgment upon himself. He would not disobey God to protect himself. So in verses 11 and 12, he said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I? Who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he prophesied this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this reason he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way and sin so that they might have cause for an evil report and they might reproach me. Note the full and complete understanding that God gave him of this message. How easily false reports can bring fear and sin and reproach if you don't know the Lord and his voice. May we walk very closely to him in these days and hear his slightest whisper. Then Nehemiah prayed as he did in every troublesome situation. Verse 14, my God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their works, and the, prof the prophetess Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. They would have made him afraid, but God, he knew his God. Those prophets will be judged one day for their works. And in spite of all the false news and false threats and fear mongers, look at verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul, which is September, in 52 days. The project began in late July, six months after Nehemiah had heard of the need. In March and April, you remember, he went and presented his need to the king. Then he traveled to Jerusalem, which took two or three months, almost as long as building the wall took. Verse 16. And it happened when all of our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things, they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by God. I love it that they heard about it and then they saw it and then they realized, wow, they went ahead in spite of us. They realized that they were fighting a losing battle. No one can win by opposing the God of heaven. Nope. In the meantime, Tobiah and the nobles of Judah were exchanging many letters. Tobiah had acceptance <clears throat> there because he was related to a lot of them. Verse 19, also they reported his good deeds before me and reported my works as well. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. I thought as I read those words, the enemy never gives up, doesn't realize that God is going to have the final answer though he knows he is a defeated foe. But God's work and God's people go forward undeterred as they put their trust in their God. The wall was built and was finished. By his grace and help, you and I will do exploits as well. Amen? Amen. How about you tonight? Are you on the winning side? You can be. If you will align yourself with the Savior and become his child, he will forgive you, he will save you, he will protect you from every fiery dart of the enemy, just as he did for Nehemiah. If you've never received Jesus, won't you do it tonight? Would you open your heart and invite him to come in? 
He so wants to live in your heart and forgive your sin and be your Savior and live there by his Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your precious word and for your servant, Nehemiah, Lord, who though he faced great difficulties, always turned to you, always trusted you to help him do the right thing, and he did. And Lord, I just pray tonight for that one listening in, that one that feels like they've made a mess of their life, and that there's no place to turn. May they know, Lord, that you have not turned them away. May they open their hearts to receive you and ask you to come in and be their Savior and forgive their sin. Live in their hearts, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. Give them grace and strength to live for you each day. And we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for hearing their prayer and ours tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to know that God heard you and accepted you as his beloved child. Thank you for joining us tonight, for your love, your prayers, and your support of this ministry. We are so grateful, and we look forward to coming to your home each Wednesday night for a wonderful Bible study. Trust that you receive from it as well. Remember the rest of our services on Friday at 10 o'clock. We offer food distribution, and at 7 o'clock, our youth meet with our youth pastors. And just come and join us. If you have a young person in your family, they will be blessed by that meeting. On Saturdays at 10, we have another food distribution. I invite you to come. On Sunday mornings at 10.30, we are now meeting in person with our worship, also by live stream. And we invite you to come in person and join us for that service. God is meeting us and doing marvelous things in our midst, and we're grateful for that. On Monday nights, we gather in our home for prayer, and we invite you to do the same thing in your home. Gather your family. Teach your children that God hears and answers prayer. It's a wonderful time to do that together. On Tuesdays at 10, Ruth's ladies meet at the church for a Bible study outline, and there's food on that day as well. And then next Wednesday, Lord willing, we'll see you again as we meet for another study in the wonderful book of Nehemiah. This week, don't live in fear. Go forward in the word that God has given to you. Do what he's given you to do and realize that he will be there with you. God bless you and may you have a week of victory.